Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents with God's Church of Love. And listen, happy Father's Day, everybody. I don't know. I don't know if that's a good thing for some of you or a bad thing. But some of us have had some tremendous fathers. And I just want to say real quick before I get into the word, as a word of exhortation and encouragement, <clears throat> God bless all of you men who have been tremendous fathers. God bless all of you men whose children know exactly who you are and know how to reach you, whose children still want to be connected to you. God bless you fathers who have warned your children about life, who have taught your children what to watch out for, who have exhorted your children about the, the positives and negatives of life and interpersonal relationships. God bless you fathers who have shared your wisdom, your successes, your failures, your mishaps, your, your, your weaknesses. You have been vulnerable and transparent with your children so they could understand they're only human. God bless you fathers for being that kind of a father. That's the kind of father I had. And I hope and pray that your children can sit down and reflect on two-hour conversations that they've had with you, hopefully more than once in a lifetime. Hopefully it wasn't a lecture, but a long, comforting conversation. And I tell you, I've had so many, I can't even count them with my father, sitting on the couch, hearing him say things like, when I was a young lad, <laughs> and the life lesson would begin. I loved those moments. And I thank God for John Henry Love, my father, born 1900, <laughs> born in North Carolina, raised in Brooklyn, New York. <clears throat> anyway, so, and born in, yeah, I said born in the turn of the century, 1900. Whoo, he was an oldie but goodie. He would be 124 years old right now if he was still alive. But anyway. So I just want to share with you <clears throat> the word that, that I believe God gave me, which is the lot of your inheritance. Hmm. We have no idea all the areas that God has plans for our lives, for our destiny. And every time I see the scriptures that say, rise up, go in and possess the land. I don't just see people rising up with their pitchforks and their spears and all of that and their daggers getting ready to go and do battle to take over somebody else's land, which did happen at times, especially when it was God's enemies. He was like, go and take their land. You know, they, they, <laughs> if they're my enemy, they're your enemy. Take the land and drive them out. So, but here's the thing. When you look at an inheritance, the beautiful part is it's everything that goes with it. If you have lamb, you probably have a house. If you have a house, you probably have furniture. If you have furniture, you probably have water, heat, and lights going on at the same time. So <clears throat> there are comforts that go with having a home. There is a freedom that goes with having your own land. And we think of it in terms of a house, land, property, acreage, all of that. But go with me to never, never land in your imagination or go with me with my imagination if you don't have one. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> think with me on this. Imagine when God says to go in and, and possess your land and drive out the enemy. You're not only driving out the people that used to occupy. No. You're driving out bitterness. You're driving out anger. You're driving out fear. You're driving out anxiety, worry. You're driving out intimidation, fear of man insecurities, low self-esteem, <clears throat> slave mentality. 
You're driving out narcissism. You're driving out the need to be in control. Control freak over here. Control freak over there. <clears throat> Multi, uh, micromanaging. You, you're driving out all of those inconsistencies, all those fallacies, the weaknesses, those things that sabotage your life and work against you. Those things that sabotage your success in your interpersonal relationships. Those things that can sabotage a marriage, sabotage a job, sabotage a career, a future, all of that. Some of you have anger issues. Mm -hmm. You have, as you go in to possess your land, that's one of those enemies you're going to have to drive out. You're going to have to do the effort of doing it. <clears throat> Some of the ways you drive the enemy out is prayer, <clears throat> resisting the devil, disobeying your flesh, and obeying God and his ways. Those are different ways that you go in and drive out the enemy. Now, we are going to read, <clears throat> Lord have mercy. As soon as I start talking, here comes the, the, the clearing of the throat. I don't know where that comes from. But anyway, okay. I want you to go with me <clears throat> to Numbers chapter 20, 33, starting at verse 51. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when you are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then, <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, you guys. You shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their pictures and destroy all their molten images and quite pluck down all their high places. And ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein. For I have given you the land to possess it. And ye shall divide the land by lot for an inheritance among your families. And to the more, ye shall give the more. And to the fewer, ye shall give the less. Now, let me stop right there. You know what that comes to mind? I'm just seeing it right now. To whom much is given, much is required. Mm -hmm. Okay, every man's inheritance shall be in the place where his lot falleth, according to the tribes of your fathers, ye shall inherit them. Here's the sad part. Some of you don't have fathers to inherit from. Some of you have deadbeat dads. Some of you have absentee dads. Some of you have one night stand out into, out into yonder. I mean, they don't know you. They don't know that you exist. You don't know who they are. All right. <clears throat> so if you need an inheritance, the best father to get your inheritance from y'all is God. He is a father. A father to the fatherless. You hear me? A friend to the friendless. A haven for the homeless. A shelter for those that have been left out in the cold by life. How many of you have been left out in the cold by life? By people, by circumstances, just left out in the cold thrown under the bus, kicked to the coib, gone. Nobody thinking about you, nobody concerned about you, worried about you, trying to figure out how to help you. Nobody cares. So you're out there on your own, fending for yourself, feeling like you're abandoned, feeling alone, feeling stranded, feeling homeless, feeling friendless, all alone. But baby cakes, you only got one direction to look, and that's up. All you got to do 
is say, Jesus, ask the Father. You pray to the Father in the name of the Son. In the name of Jesus, Father, please rescue me. Please show me where to go, what to do, what to say, and when, to whom, where. Show me how. You're not alone, y'all. The sad part is, as the Bible says, you have not because you ask not. There are many out there that won't ask. They're too proud to ask, or they don't want anybody knowing the dire circumstances with which they live. Mm. They don't want people knowing how bad things have gotten, how screwed up their life is. They don't want to know. They don't want people to know that because they already feel bad about themselves. But baby cakes, God already knows. He already knew where you were headed before you hit rock bottom. But when you're at rock bottom, baby, the only way to look is up. Ain't no, ain't, ain't no need in looking down anymore. You're as low as you can go. Look up. <clears throat> the song goes, when you walk through the storm, hold your head up high and don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of the storm is a golden sky and a sweet silver song of a lark. Walk on through the wind. Walk on through the rain, though your dreams be tossed and blown. Walk on, walk on with hope in your heart, and you will never walk alone. You will never walk alone. I say walk on with God in your heart. He is the fulfillment of your hope. All right. <clears throat> mm, excuse me. Verse 55. But if ye will not. <clears throat> I'm so sorry, y'all. <clears throat> but if ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your side and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. Moreover, it shall come to pass that I shall do unto you as I thought to do unto them, your enemies. All right, now listen. <clears throat> I added the, your enemies part just for, just for clarity's sake. All right. <clears throat> the thing we don't realize is the stripes on Jesus' is back. When you look at the old slavery pictures and you there's one famous picture of a black man with his hand on his hip and he's sitting there with his back toward the cameraman and his back is marked up with all these, thank God they were healed, but they were lacerations. <clears throat> Scars from being whipped and whipped and whipped and whipped mercilessly. I never could understand how a person could treat slaves like that and think they were doing God's will. Never could see how they, how anybody can beat up on anybody. How anybody can whip and slap and beat and punch and kick and think it's okay. I don't get that. So, you know, that does not compute in my mind because all I'm thinking is, how can you inflict so much pain on one person like that? I wouldn't even do it to a dog. And you're doing it to humans? Anyway, moving right along. So when I look at those stripes, my point I'm trying to make is that's what Jesus' back must have looked like as well. Only his wounds were raw and still open. And when they whipped him, they used these whips that had these, these I don't know, charred attachments to them where it was meant to cut the skin open. Now, I don't know what sick mind came up with that. I mean, having to be whipped 30 or 40 times is bad enough. I mean, everything in your body seemed like it would go out, including your brain. You would faint under the pain. 
or die under it. But the crazy part is that they put things on there to cut the skin open. Why? What kind of sick mind would do that? All right. Think of all the scars, all the open, runny, bleeding wounds on the back of Jesus. You know, they have your name on it, my name on it, everybody's name on it. Whosoever will, let them come. And every stripe is for us to heal. By his stripes, you are healed. You hear me? By his stripes, we are healed. I am healed. And here's the thing. You're not just healed physically. You're healed mentally. Psychologically, that is. Emotionally. Spiritually, as well as physically. Mm -hmm. By his stripes, you are healed. So, what I want to share with you on that is when Jesus died on the cross, he died so that we can be empowered by the Holy Spirit that drove him, that now indwells us. And that Holy Spirit enables us to go in and possess our land. See, Satan, think about it this way. Satan is a squatter. Satan sits on your head from the day you're born. He's whistling for his little home, for his little cronies to get up in there, his little imps, familiar spirits and all them. He's assigning them to you for life. And they're getting to know you real well, baby. They know your patterns. They know your thought processes because of the things you say. Not because they're all that knowing. It's because they're observant. <laughs> so that's the assignment against you. And Satan will try to use you against you. He will use your weaknesses to sabotage your future. He will use your fears to paralyze your progress. Listen, all the things he's working to sabotage you, to limit you, to steal, kill, and destroy. Imagine how far you could have gone in life had your emotions not had you on lockdown. Imagine how much you could have accomplished had your emotions not been kept captive by the enemy. So what you have to do is constantly ask God for freedom. One of the things that will set you free is the word T-R-U-T-H. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. I remember one time I was playing uh, Scrabble and my opponent was getting a fat attitude because I was kicking butt. Now, what they didn't get, what well, they were trying to impress me with the big words they knew. And I was working strategy. And when I looked at that board and I saw the letters that were already down and, the, and what I had to work with, I had two letters that were usable. Nothing else could have done that much for me. Not much, but I had a letter I, which is one point, and the letter S, which is either one or four. I forget what, but I wouldn't have made no more than, than, than two to, to five points on that. Depending on what else I connected, I might have made seven or eight, but I saw something. I kept looking at that board, looking at that board. Listen to this, y'all. As I'm looking at the board, I saw the setup, and I said, ah. Oh, if I put this here and put that there, it's connected to that word and that word, and it's on a triple word score, and that was a... I said, uh-uh, I got to go for this one. And I had triple word score in two directions. 
I ended up making 40 points off of two little measly letters based on where I laid them. Now, listen to this. My opponent got angry, got up, and walked away. I'm like, wait a minute. Weren't we just having fun? This is called a game. <laughs> you know, we're playing here, right? <clears throat> we're not betting money, none of that. But listen to this. The person came back about five minutes later. And apologize. Now here's where the truth comes in. They told the truth on themselves. <laughs> I know y'all thought I was lost. Well, she talking about Scrabble. She was just talking about the truth. I am still talking about it. Listen to this, y'all. They sat down and said, I was trying to impress you with the words I knew, with my wide vocabulary. And what I realized is you outsmarted me by playing through strategy. You weren't trying to impress me. You were trying to win. That's what made me angry. My pride got in the way. So from that point on, when we played Scrabble, they stopped being angry and they would ask me, now, what are you looking at? What's your strategy? And I tell them, I want to make 15 to 20 points and I'm looking for two or three things I can hook up with that one letter that'll give me two or three words at one time. And hopefully it'll land on the triple word score. I'm always looking for stuff like that when I play Scrabble. I'm looking at the numbers, y'all. I ain't looking at, at how pretty the words can look. <laughs> so. What I want to share with you is when you know the truth about yourself, it sets you free. Here's another example. They never had an issue with, with me beating them in Scrabble. From that point on, there was a time they beat me as well. Now, one time <clears throat> I had a dream. I will share how God will show you yourself. I love this about God. He will take you to the depths of yourself that you didn't even know was still there. You forgot all about it. You so old. Well, that was my case anyway. Okay. And in this dream, this lady was throwing out a bunch of old stuff. One of the things she was throwing out, one of the categories was old purses, old pocketbooks. I'm looking at them and she's throwing them out. <clears throat> Excuse me. I noticed one that looked like she got it imported from a rape from Saudi Arabia somewhere, from the Mediterranean. This particular pocketbook looked like it was hand woven, like it was uh, embroidered by hand. It was, it had threads of gold. I mean, it was just magnificent. I've never seen anything like that to this day. That thing was so beautiful. I had to have it. And I said, so this is in your junk pile, right? Yeah. So that means you don't want that, right? No. Okay. So does that mean I can have it? Sure. You know, you see something over there? Yeah, help yourself. I said, oh, thank you. I said, this is mine. And I'm looking at the pocketbook. I'm opening it up. I'm looking at how much can it hold because I'm always loading up my pocketbooks like a suitcase. I'm looking at the inside, the outside. So we can't put a lot in there, but I can sure dress up in this baby. Oh, this is so regal. It's so exotic. It's so, oh, it just had this whole Middle Eastern flair to it. It's just beautiful. Well, what happens next? While I'm admiring my new find, it snatched out of my hand suddenly. And I'm like, what? And she's holding it. And I'm like, what's wrong? She said, I changed my mind. I'm going to hold on to it. So-and-so is coming in from out of town. I want to see if she wants it. <gasps> I was livid. I was hurt. I was offended. Why? It made me feel like I didn't count. It made me feel like anybody else's desires were way more important than mine. Now, she had given it to me. It was mine. 
And she took it back. On a maybe. Didn't even know if the woman would even want it. That thing upset me so bad, y'all. I woke up crying. <laughs> yes, I did. And I asked a lot of very interesting story. You got to stick with me on this. This is how God deals with us on the inner man if we let him. He will go down in your cesspool of horrors if you're not too ashamed to let him in. He already knows. He knows what you don't know. He knows what you forgot. He knows what you haven't even done yet. <laughs> okay, check this out. So I'm sitting there crying. Oh, God. Oh, why would she do that? Why would I have such a, a dream? Oh, that was horrible. I was upset from a dream, y'all. God, right then, arrested my spirit, got my attention. I felt him. He said, I want to deal with that. I said, well, deal with what? And then he took my memory all the way back to something. Listen, y'all, I had totally forgotten all about, totally forgotten about it. He took me all the way back to when I was seven years old, outside playing. And I came in the house to use the restroom. And I saw my mother had company and it was a little toddler, little year and a half year old baby sitting on a, on a little blanket on the floor playing with my balloon. My balloon, y'all, I was livid. No, no, no. I know my mother did not go in my room, take something that belonged to me and give to some kid I don't even know. I was just too through. Yes, I was a child, y'all. Remember, children are self-centered. Children are selfish. It's all about me. You know how that goes when we're young. All right. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Yeah. So here I was. I, I was totally upset. Because my mother didn't even honor me enough or value me enough to say, do you mind if this baby plays with this balloon? I would have said, can she play with something else? Because that balloon was a helium balloon that had stayed inflated longer than any balloon I had ever seen. It was inflated for about, it, oh, oh, well over a week. And it hadn't even begun to seep, to seep out, to leak or, you know, or hover down. It was still... It was still floating high and strong, fully inflated with helium. When that baby got through with that, the reason I was so upset was because when the baby was on the floor, the blank on top of a blanket, and had finished playing with my poor little balloon that was laying like a little flat pancake, poor thing. <laughs> that thing spoke volumes to me of how much my desires didn't matter to my mother. I already had issues with her in the first place. I always thought that she wished I had never been born. And then she would be quick to hug a child down the street that she never met before. Come give Auntie Edith a hug. And she'd get a hug with a, with a kid she didn't know, but her own child would say, Mommy, can I have a hug? And her response to me would be, Oh, hurry up, Patty. You know you give me the creeps. So yes, I had issues. <laughs> God had to heal all of them. And a lot of the ways he did them was through dreams. But the way he dealt with it was he would show me the issue and then give me time to acknowledge it. I had to honestly say, yes, I can see it. That's what got me upset. I felt like my mother preferred someone else over me as usual. I felt like my desires, my opinions did not count, didn't add up to a hill of beans with her. I did not matter to her. That was, that was the feeling. That's what that communicate. Whether she meant it that way or not, that's the way, that's what it said to me. And because that's what it said to me, along with all of her other actions, comments, and lack of action, and lack of affection that just reinforced that whole belief system. I ended up growing up with a lot of rage, a lot of insecurity. I stuttered 
as if I was retarded. I stuttered so bad you could hardly make out what I was saying, believe it or not. So all of that came from emotional scars, all of it. My outbursts, I probably would have been diagnosed as, as bipolar back then. No, God let me know it was simply rage. Pent up emotions that were never released, never really dealt with. See, when God shows you something about yourself, when God shows you what the enemy has done in your camp, how he has trespassed and contaminated your waters, your land, your, 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 your uh, food, your produce, whatever, whatever he has poisoned in your life, God, the stripes on the back of Jesus will clean that up. But you must invite him in to the darkest recesses of your life to get that crap out. And you, along with Jesus, you must cooperate with him now. You must drive out the enemy. When I got through you know, me and the Lord and him showing me all that, I'm like, God, take the anger out. Take the resentment out. Heal that hurt. I immediately started praying on it. And then I asked God to deliver me. And I cast out that spirit. I, I didn't know what to call it, so I described it. I cast you out in the name of Jesus. You that whatever you are that makes me feel like everybody else is preferred above me. Like I'm the I'm the last resort on everybody's list, even my mama. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I rebuke those lies. I cancel them. You have to drive out the enemy. You cannot let him squat on your life. You cannot let him squat on your mind, on your heart, on your emotions. You cannot let him squat on your relationships. Kick that turkey to the curb and tell him never return again. But here's the thing. When God sent the Israelites to go in and possess the land, they had to fight for it. So when you walk into this newfound faith with Jesus, you are walking into the good fight of faith. Mm -hmm. And you are fighting your way to victory. You do it through spiritual warfare. You do it through declaring God's word over your life. You do it through prayer requests, crying out to God, pouring your heart out before him. You do it through confessing and, and leaving that crap behind you. You also do it through forgiveness because some things will never leave you until you leave it. And if you're not willing to leave it alone, it will never leave you. It will hound you and haunt you and vex you and, and become that thorn in your side that this was talking about because you won't let it go and if you don't know how to let it go as soon as you let it go you go back and pick it back up say god take it from me i don't care if i scratch and dig to go back and get it again Take it from me and hide it so I can't even find it. Get this poison out of me, Lord, please. Only you can do this. And you'd be shocked at the many ways God will heal your mind, body, and soul. Boom, boom, boom. It may not happen overnight because the way he has the Israelites go in to possess the land and drive out the enemy, he always says, by little, and by little. So in other words, it's step by step, move by move. You do a little over here, you get rid of that. And you gotta go over here and deal with that. And then you do it over here and you deal with this that you had already forgotten about. And then God says, psst, psst, come here. Let me show you something. I want you to, I wanna deal with this. And there are times when you cannot forgive. God knows it, and he understands why. But he is the enabler, so that's not an excuse. All you have to do is say, God, give me the ability to forgive, and I will. 
I will be able to. Give me the desire and the ability to forgive. Because I don't have it. See, whatever God requires of you, he is so fair that he will enable you and empower you to do what you normally could not do on your own. It wouldn't happen. Not depending on you to get it done. But God. All right. Now, so now you know God wants you to go in and possess your land. But you also know it's a fight. The possession process is a fight. You have to get rid of the squatters. You got to get rid of the rodents. Those are the demons that haunt you. You got to get rid of the roaches. Those are little imps that mess with your mind, that try to sabotage every progress, every bit of progress you make. Mm -hmm. You got to uh, drive out the enemy. You got to clean out the mold. All of that stuff that can harm you from your past, all those bitter memories and sour feelings. Yeah, you got to get rid of all that. All that has to be cleaned out with that supernatural bleach that only God has. And let me tell you, God will help you. He will teach you. He will guide you. He will empower you. He will equip you. And when he's done, with that area, because every area, there's still more land ahead of you. Every area that he has for you to conquer, guess what? As soon as that's conquered, you are stronger because you're going from glory to glory, from strength to strength. <laughs> and after, listen, the beautiful part is after every victory. He will strengthen, settle you, and establish you. You know why he has to strengthen and settle you? Because you've probably been flying off the handle all your life. Putting out this fire, putting out that fire. Everything's a big deal. Everything's a tragedy. Everything's a crisis. Oh, no. What am I going to do? Oh, no. Ah! Yeah. God will settle you. So when the next crisis occurs, You'd be like, okay, Lord, how are we going to work with this one? <laughs> oh, I don't feel like dealing with no mess, but how are you going to deal with this, Lord? I know you will provide. I know you will make a way where there is no way. You've done it too many times in my past. So now you're not hitting the panic button. Why? Because he has strengthened you and he has settled you while he is establishing you. I love God. He is just so marvelous the way he works in our lives. <clears throat> what is Jeremiah? I think it's 29. I forgot the verse. I think it's 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you. Plans to bless you and not harm you. Plans to give you a hope and an expected and a hope in the future. God bless you as you look forward to what God has for you. What God has for you, it is for you. I know without a doubt, he will surely pull you out. What God has for you, it is for you. It is for you. If God is for you, who, what can be against you? Amen? All right. God bless you. Be encouraged. Hold your head up high. You're not going through this storm alone, and you never will, because God is with you. And that's what the Bible means when he is called Emmanuel, God with us. Amen.